Good afternoon, CrossFit youth. Welcome to another Wednesday night cross training. I'm glad that y'all are giving me just a few minutes of your day today to uh, allow me to speak into your life and uh, teach you the Word of God. Um, that's definitely what I'm going to try to do tonight is teach you something from the Word of God. Uh, we, we all need that in our lives daily. Um, and, and, and if not daily, several times a week. So uh, thank you for um, giving me just a few more minutes of your time this week. Um, not going to be long tonight. I know y'all believe that, right? Um, but uh, a, a little bit of good news. Um, it sounds like uh, things shortly will um, start getting back to normal. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe in the next uh, two to three weeks we'll be back together again, and I cannot wait for that. Miss Rebecca cannot wait for that. So uh, look forward to seeing y'all again. We love y'all and we miss you. Um, tonight's lesson um, is a lesson that that I kind of put together last night. Um, uh, we're going to take a break from the Word of Life series that uh, we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, and uh, we're going to talk about something that that I feel like God wants me um, to speak into your life. Um, I, I really felt the leading of the Lord to um, to teach this lesson tonight, and, and I've really felt drawn um, to the life of Joshua recently. And it uh, seems like God keeps bringing Joshua's name into my mind. And so I, I wanted to uh, kind of talk about a little bit about the life of Joshua tonight. And, um, you know, in the coming weeks, we may go a little more in-depth into the life of Joshua and maybe even, you know, go through the book of Joshua. Um, maybe we'll do that um, Wednesday night cross-training, or maybe we'll do that on uh, Sunday mornings in Sunday school. I don't know, but we'll, we'll see. Um, I'll try to follow the Lord's lead in that. Um, but I want you to get your Bibles. Um, we will be using the Bible again tonight. So, uh, so go get your Bibles. Just... Um, while you're getting those, a little bit of a backstory um, to tonight's lesson. Um, we're going to be in the book of Numbers, okay? And Numbers is one of the books in the Bible that Moses wrote. Um, it's one of the first books of the Bible. And um, so let me give you the backstory here. Um, so Moses had went to Egypt um, at God's command and following God's lead. And he had led the people of Israel out of captivity in Egypt. And he had led them out uh, toward the promised land. Um, during the time uh, between them coming out of Egypt and where we kind of pick up the story today, a few things happened. It had been about a year, I believe, since they left Egypt up until the point where we really start our lesson tonight. Um, but they had come out of Egypt. They had crossed the Red Sea. Um, God had given Moses, and Moses had relayed um, to the people of Israel sort of the laws of society. So they were kind of like a, a new society, out on their own in God's leading instead of, uh, for the past 400 years, the Hebrews or the Israelites had been in Egypt. So they had never been a part of their own society. So God um, handed down laws and rules of society that they were um, to go by. Um, during this time, God also gave Moses, and Moses relayed to the people, the Ten Commandments. Also during this time, God had given Moses the instruction on building the tabernacle, which, which was the um, kind of a mobile uh, place of worship um, that they would move from place to place when, when they can't in one place, they would set up the tabernacle. That's where they would make sacrifice and worship God. And when God would instruct them to move to another place, it, it's kind of like they, they packed it up and they moved it to another place. And the tabernacle also was where uh, the Ark of the Covenant was housed as well. So um, that's kind of the backstory here, which leads us up to uh, the time that we're going to uh, talk about tonight. So get your Bibles and turn to the book of Numbers. Now, it's, it's at the front of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So it's the fourth book of the Bible, and we're going to be in chapter 13. Chapter 13, and we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 16. I'll give you just a minute to get there. I want to take a sip of my tea. 
I don't know what it is about recording these videos. I always get nervous and my mouth always gets dry. So I gotta have my teeth. And it's in my favorite mason jar. Love drinking out of mason jars. All right, so Numbers chapter 13, verse one through 16. It says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send thou men, <coughs> excuse me, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel. Every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, everyone a ruler among them. Now, uh, let me just mention this before we go to uh, verse 3. God had promised the Israelites the land of Canaan. This was the land that God had promised, dating all the way back to Abraham. Okay? Um, God had promised that he would give them the land of Canaan for their inheritance, for, their, for them to live there and dwell there and raise their families there. That would be their land. But after they left Israel, there was like 10 times that the Israelites um, got discouraged and they lost their faith in the promise of God um, as a whole. And they would say things like, Moses, why did you bring us out here? just to die. We should have stayed in Egypt where we had food and shelter and clothing and we were safe to raise our families. Yes, we were slaves. Yes, we were mistreated, but at least we had a life. You brought us out here to die. So they lost trust in God's promise. And what had happened was this was one of those times where the people were like, okay, it's been a year. God has brought us out here to die. We should have stayed in Egypt. Uh, what are you going to do about this, Moses? What we need to do, Moses, is we need to go ahead and send spies out into the land of Canaan to, to spy it out and check it out, see what kind of people are there, see what kind of land there is there, because we need to know what we're getting into, okay? Are we going to go try to take this land and, and they're going to slaughter us and we're all going to die. Have you brought us out here to die, Moses? Is this what's going to happen? It's been a year. Let's get this thing going. Well, Moses was following the lead of God. He was following his timing and his instruction. But the people didn't want God's timing and God's instruction. So they pressured Moses to send spies out into the land. Well, so Moses went to God and asked him, he said, these people are pressuring me to send out spies, and God allowed Moses to send spies into the land. So that's where we're at in this uh, scripture that we're at now. Verse 3, And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them into the wilderness of Paran, and all those men uh, were heads of the children of Israel. And these were the names of the spies um, that were sent into Israel. Um, the land of Paran, or the, the land of Canaan. Um, these were their names. Of the tribe of Reuben, Shama, the son of Zachar. Of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son, son of Hari. Of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Of the tribe of Issachar, Egal, the son of Joseph. Of the tribe of Ephraim, Joshua, the son of Nun. Of the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu, of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodi, of the tribe of Joseph, namely of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi, of the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Jermali, of the son of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael, and of the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vafshi, of the tribe of Gad, Gul, the son of Machai. Now, I know that was a, a lot of funny names, but, but there's a reason that I mentioned all of those names, and there's a reason that it's listed here in God's Word. So just kind of stick with me. Verse 16, the last verse in this little section that we're going to read. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land, and Moses called Oshi, the son of Nun, Joshua. So, so Joshua's Hebrew name was really Oshi, but um, Moses renamed him Joshua. There, there's a lot of significance when you see in the Bible where someone was renamed. 
So um, just, just remember that when you read in the Bible where someone's name was changed, a lot of Bibles have commentary uh, explaining why, and you can even Google that, and a lot of times, you know, you need to look for a good biblical source on Google. Um, sometimes Wikipedia and some of those others are not real good references, but good, look for a good Bible teaching uh, website that will uh, explain to you those things. So 12 men were sent out to spy the land, and Moses gave them instruction to go out into the land and spy it out to see if the land is, is good or bad, to see if there were trees, hills, or are there flat lands, if the people were many or few. Is there a ton of people there? Or is it like a crowded place and tons and tons of people? Or is it just kind of a scattered few among the land? Are the people that live in that land strong or weak? Check out the cities. Are they camps or strongholds? Are they like tent cities or are they fortified cities? Big forts with huge walls. Forty days they spied out the land and they came back to report to Moses and the children of Israel about what they found. So we're going to um, go to, um, so we're going to stay in chapter 13 and we're going to read chapter, or excuse me, verse 26 through chapter 14, verse, uh, through verse 10, the first part of verse 10. Um, and this, this will take just a couple of minutes, and then we'll, we'll uh, start explaining things. And Moses sent them out to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Get you up they, this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land and what it is and the people who dwell there, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what is the land that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad? And what cities they um, are there that they dwell in, whether they are tents or strongholds? And what is the land, whether it be fat or lean? That means whether it's, it's good fertile land that grows a lot of good crops and good fruit trees and stuff, or whether it's kind of desert and dry land. That's what that fat or lean means. I'm reading out of the King James Version because this particular... Um, these books that I'm reading out of, uh, it's just personal preference of mine to read out of the King James. So they went up and they searched the land. Um, and they ascended from the south and came to Hebron. And it names a few cities. And, and the children of Anak were there. That's going to come into play in just a minute. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. And they came to the brook of Eschol, and they cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bore it between two upon a staff, and they brought the pomegranates and the figs. So this, this um, uh, uh, cluster of grapes, uh, I wanted to say branch, but it, I knew that wasn't the right word. This cluster of grapes was so huge that it took two men um, to attach it to like a rod and carry it two men, uh, one, one end of the rod on one shoulder and the other end of the rod on the shoulder of another man. That's how huge and heavy that this one cluster of grapes was. The place was called the Brook of Eschol because the cluster of grapes, which the children of Israel cut down from there, and they returned from the searching after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and Aaron, and all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran, and they brought back word unto them, unto the congregation, and they showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land where you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. So they showed them the cluster of grapes, and the figs, and the pomegranates, how huge and delicious they were. And um, so when it, let me explain that about milk and honey. It flows with milk and honey. And this was in the prophecy that had been given to them over the years that God said that I will take you to a land that uh, flows with milk and honey. All right, so back then milk was, was uh, a commodity and honey was a commodity. So milk, when you, if you think about it, <clears throat> if you drink, drink a glass of water, that quenches your thirst. Okay? But a glass of milk will, when, 
when you drink a glass of milk, it's soothing. It goes down smooth and it kind of fills your stomach. It's like it has more uh, smoothness and, and, and substance in your stomach. And, and it kind of, it fills you up. Whereas you drink a bunch of water and, you know, it quenches your thirst, but it doesn't really satisfy any part of your hunger. Well, milk um, satisfies a little bit of that hunger. It goes down smooth. It kind of coats your stomach. It's, I love milk. I, some people don't like milk, but I love it. And I love the way that it feels uh, going down into my stomach. I know that's weird, but okay, that's what it was. So what about the honey? All right, so back then, they didn't have, like we have, sugar. Okay, they didn't have five pound bags of sugar that you went and buy, bought at the store and, and you make Kool-Aid or tea and you put two cups of sugar in it and stir it up and it, and it makes it sweet. They didn't have that. But honey, if you think about it, honey is like one of the sweetest things on earth. And back then, the only other than honey, if you wanted to eat something sweet, you ate fruit. So I know these days, if we're craving something sweet, we want a piece of candy or Kool-Aid or a piece of cake or a Debbie cake or something like that. And, and that's really, really sweet. But then, you know, we, we, we don't want fruit when we want something sweet most of the time. But then, if they wanted something sweet, um, honey was kind of hard to come by unless you were in the right place to find it. And then you had to fight the bees to get it. But, uh, um, so when they crave something sweet, honey was what they got, unless all they had was fruit. So honey was a commodity. Uh, people desired honey. It was, it was very expensive, honey was, if you bought it back then. So that's why it says that it flows with milk and honey. All right, nevertheless, the people uh, is strong. So they, they've said, okay, here's the fruit that we brought back, and look how wonderful it is. You were right what God said, that this is a land of plenty. It's a fertile land. It's a great land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. But 28, verse 28 says, Nevertheless, in other words, but the people who live there are strong. And the cities have great walls. And they're huge cities. And Worse than that, the children of Anak lived there. Now, Anak was a giant. And the children of Anak were, it's not talking about little kids, these were the descendants of Anak. Okay? There's one person in the Bible you may be thinking of right now. Goliath was a direct descendant of Anak. This is the family line he came from. That's why he was a giant. And the Amaleks dwelt in the land to the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So all these people that they just named, these, these groups of people, these ethnic groups of people, were ruthless people. And they were constantly fighting and battling between the other groups of people that were around them. But verse 30 says, And Caleb, one of the twelve spies, stilled or quieted the people before Moses. And he said, Let us go up at once and possess the land. For we are able, we are well able to overcome it. But the men who went up with him, okay, ten of the others, we'll see the other one in a minute because there was twelve Caleb spoke up. The other men that spoke up against him were ten. All the men who went up with, with him said, We are not able to go up against these people. They are stronger than us. And they brought an evil report from the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. In other words, these people are strong. They're big. They have fortified cities. They're always battling with one another, and they devour each other in battle all the time. We witness this with our eyes, and all the people that are in it saw, um, excuse me, all the people that we saw in the land 
are men of great stature. In other words, they were powerful, skilled uh, men of weaponry and of uh, war. And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come from the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in that sight. In other words, we felt this big standing up against these people when we were going in as spies. We cannot go in and possess the land. Do not listen to Caleb. We will go in there and we will be annihilated. That's what these 10 spies were saying. Starting in uh, chapter 14, and we're going to read down to the first part of uh, verse 10. And all the congregation, that means all the, the people of Israel, lifted up their voice and cried, and people wept that night. And all the children of Israel, again, murmured against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God have had us died in the wilderness in between Egypt and here? And why has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey to these people? Wasn't it better? Wouldn't it be better if we just went back to Egypt and said, we surrender, we'll be your slaves again? And they said to one another, let us make a new captain and let us return to Egypt. In other words, they were ready to kick Moses out, throw him out, like impeaching a president. It's like they were, they were rejecting him as their leader and they were going to select a new leader that was on their side that didn't want to go into the promised land, that wanted to take them back to Egypt, and they were going to select that leader to take them back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all of this assembly and congregation of the children of Israel. Right there in front of everybody, before the meeting was over, they fell on their faces and prayed to God. And Joshua, here's the first time we hear about Joshua, and Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were with them who searched out the land, tore their clothes in front of the congregation. Now, this was a sign of anguish and anger and disappointment in what was going on. And all of those people understood what uh, was going on when they were tearing their clothes. And they spoke to all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. So here's Joshua standing up and saying, I'm with Caleb. This is a good land just like God had promised. Verse 8 says, If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us to this land. In other words, if God is pleased with us and loves us like he said that he does, then he will lead us into this land, and he will give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. But do not rebel against the Lord, Joshua says. Neither fear you the people of the land, for they are bread for us, and their defense is departed from them. See, Joshua, I like old Joshua now. He's not only speaking in the faith, that the prom of the promise that God had given them and the faith in God himself. But he's saying that God has already torn down their defenses. God has gone out before us and prepared everything for us to go and, and uh, inhabit the land. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear those people, Joshua said. First part of verse 10 says, But all the congregation they'd stone them with stones. In other words, they, they all said, we ought to not only choose us a leader to take us back to Egypt, because we don't believe we can in inherit this land, but we are going to stone Joshua and Caleb to death because of their report. Now that's bad. That's, that's real bad. This is another step further than just choosing a leader to go back. They now want to kill the messengers of God. Just to quickly kind of skip over some things, 
Those 10 spies, by the way, they didn't choose a leader to take them back to Egypt because those 10 spies, God said, would be hit with a plague and they would die. That they would catch a disease and they would die. But that Joshua and Caleb, because they believed the promise of God and they brought a good report and they spoke in faith and they stood up for him, they would not catch this disease and they would live. Because of unbelief, the congregation would not enter uh, the promised land. This was another thing that God spoke after that meeting and after the, the children of Israel's rebellion against God. He said, okay, you've said that God has brought us out here for our children to be killed by these people that we're supposed to be going up against. God said, I tell you what, because of your unbelief and your rebellion against me and my promise, because of your lack of faith, you will be the ones to die in this wilderness and you won't even get to go into the promised land. But your children, they will inherit the promise that I have given my people. God said that Caleb and Joshua would be the only adults to enter the promised land. The only people of, the, of all of the, the, the camp of Israel at that time that were adults that would enter the promised land were Joshua and Caleb. Besides them, all of the children would inherit the promise. Now, something to keep in mind here is very interesting, and you can read in X, or excuse me, you can read in Numbers and Deuteronomy, I'm pretty sure, why Moses was not able to inherit the land. That story is for another day. So uh, here's where the, the main point of tonight's lesson is. This, this was really leading up to where we can use the example of Joshua and apply it to our life. Now, I'm, I've named this lesson the making of a leader. Okay? The making of a leader. Now, some of you may have plans one day to become leaders. Maybe you have a plan to own your own business. Maybe you have in your mind that you would like to be a manager of a bank or um, a, a, a construction site manager. Um, maybe you have in mind that you would like to be a spiritual leader one day. Maybe you feel like you're called to be a pastor. Or maybe you feel God speaking to you a little bit that someday you will be a teacher of God's Word. Or that you will be a youth pastor or a children's minister. Or maybe a worship leader. This lesson is for you. And this is where you need to start paying attention to the life of Joshua and the example that Joshua gives us, the making of a leader. From this point on, as you read through these books that Moses wrote, Joshua became Moses' student. He became his right-hand man. He became Moses' trusted friend and advisor. See, he recognized the leadership the godly leadership in Moses, and he attached himself to Moses to learn from. God tells Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 38, to mentor Joseph and to encourage him because God said that Joshua would actually be the one to cause Israel to inherit the promised land. God revealed that to Moses. So Moses started mentoring Joshua and made him his right hand man. Moses actually at one point put Joshua in charge of uh, a battle when uh, the people of Amalek came against Israel to try to fight them and defeat them and kill them. But 
uh, Moses put him in charge of that battle, and Joshua and the people of Israel won that battle against the people of Amalek. Joshua went with Moses up the mountain for Moses to receive the Ten Commandments. God told Moses, I have written laws on tablets of stone. Come up on top of the mountain and I will give them to you and I will instruct you and I will bless you to present this to my people. He took Joshua with him. He was his right-hand man. Where Moses went, Joshua went. So Joshua went up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. Now, now tradition says Moses went to the top of the mountain and Joshua went about halfway up. And, and they would meet and, and converse uh, during this time that Moses was up in the, the mountain. Um, Joshua went with Moses into the tabernacle to pray and to worship and to offer sacrifice. And Joshua would actually at times stay behind in the tabernacle after Moses left and continue to worship and seek God and to pray. Next page. So Numbers uh, chapter 27, if you read that um, chapter, God actually tells Moses that he would die soon. Okay, we're moving right along with this story. God tells Moses, I'm, I'm not going to allow you to enter the promised land because of a certain thing that Moses did and took part in that God specifically instructed him not to do. He did it anyway because of the pressure on him um, to do a particular thing uh, that the people of Israel wanted him to do. So God tells Moses, it, it is time for you to die. And, and by the way, God, uh, Moses did not get old and feeble. The Bible says that he was strong and he had not digressed in his health or regressed in his health. He was a strong, healthy man at the time that he died. So God tells Moses that he will die soon. And Moses asked God to appoint a leader, someone to take charge after he dies, someone to um, take charge over the people of Israel after he's gone. So God answers Moses and he names Joshua. He said about Joshua that he was a man in whom is the Spirit of God. And he instructs Moses to anoint Joshua in front of all the people of Israel as his successor. So he not only uh, lets Joseph, or excuse me, Joshua know that he will be his successor, but he lets the whole uh, camp of Israel, millions of people by this time, um, know that he will be his successor and he will be their leader after he is gone. And at 120 years old, Moses died. Okay, so now take your Bibles again and go to um, go to Deuteronomy. No, uh, we're actually going to go to Joshua, the book of Joshua. Um, which is just after the book of Deuteronomy. All right, Joshua. We're going to read um, chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, and verse 5, and verse 7. Joshua chapter 1, 1 through 3, 5, and 7. It says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, go over this river Jordan, you and all these people, unto the land which I give unto them, even the children of Israel. So now is the time, God says, for you, Joshua, to stand up and be a leader of these people under my blessing and take them into this land that I have promised you. So, 
they come to the banks of the River Jordan, which, by the way, the River Jordan, years later, is where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Another little side note, this name Joshua was a Hebrew name. The Hebrews were the children of Israel. It was a Hebrew name, and the name Jesus is a Greek name. Jesus is the Greek translation of Joshua. So what did Jesus come to do? He came to deliver the people and take them into the promises of God, of forgiveness of sin. What is Joshua about to do? Joshua is about to deliver by the hand of God the people of Israel into their promise. Kind of neat. Okay, verse 3. Every place, this is God talking to Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that means walk on, that land I have given you, just as I promised Moses. A, a, a little commentary about that verse right there. It says, it was not God's will that one foot breath was to rest in the hands of its former owners. Likewise, the Holy Spirit intends uh, presently, right now, for everything in our lives to be removed which hinders our progress with the Lord. It is God's will that we possess the entirety of the promise of God, us today. And that pertains to total victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Basically, total victory over sin in our lives. That's the promise that God gives us. So this is how we can apply this to our life. Now, verse 5. There shall not be any man able to stand before you when you get into this land all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, Joshua, so I will be with you. I will not fail, and I will not forsake you. Verse 7, But be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all I have commanded you, which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn to, from it, from the right or the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This is the same promise that we have today with Jesus Christ. We need to be strong and courageous and have faith in the promise of God and not go to the right or to the left from God's uh, instructions, from God's word for our life. And he will prosper us wherever we go. Now, let's look at the example of Joshua. We're finishing up right here, but this is the most important part of the lesson. Don't turn me off. This right here is what I was getting to. Five more minutes. Number one, Joshua, okay, this is how, this is how he, he, he's an example as a leader. How we can become leaders by following the example of Joshua. Joshua believed God. He had faith in God and his promise. That's step number one. Believe God, believe his promise, and have faith in him. Number two, Joshua um, was not persuaded by unbelievers. Remember the ten spies that did not believe the promise of God, that saw everything around them, and they said, I can't do this. We cannot do this. This thing that God is asking us to do. We cannot do it. It's too hard. Joshua was not persuaded by their unbelief and their lack of faith. Number three, Joshua stood for truth when all others stood against it. He stood for truth when all others stood against it. In the face of ten spies, two people stood up not to mention the whole congregation of Israel siding with the ten spies. Not to mention standing before these people that are threatening to stone them to death. 
They stood up for what they believed in. They stood up for truth when everybody else around them stood against it. Number four, Joshua recognized and followed his earthly authority, Moses. He recognized and followed Moses' leadership, his instruction, and that the Spirit of God, he recognized that the Spirit of God was in Moses. And Joshua picked the right person to follow. See, you can be led astray if you pick the wrong person to follow. If we want to come up under a, a godly authority to learn from, to become a godly leader in the future, we have to make sure that the person we're following is following God. You can't just follow anybody. Because some people uh, in the natural realm may have good leadership skills and they may be able to speak well, but if they're not following God, they will lead you astray. Let me tell you the perfect place to find a godly leader to follow and mold your life around, and that's in church. Number five, Joshua attached himself to Moses and learned from him as a leader. So every chance he got, he was with Moses. Every chance he got, he found Moses and he followed Moses around. He listened to him. He asked him questions. He watched him and his interaction with the people, his interaction with God. So he learned from his leader. Number six, Joshua did not jump the gun in his leadership role. He knew he was anointed to be the next leader, but he did not try to go out ahead of Moses and start trying to go ahead and lead. He didn't jump the gun. He followed Moses as his leader until it was God's time for him to lead. Joshua only was a secondary leader for Israel until Moses' leadership was completed. Um, number seven, Joshua was close to God the whole time. From before the time God said he would be the successor to Moses until the time when God placed him in that leadership role, the whole time, in good times and bad, in hard times and in easy times, in times when he was full and, and not thirsty, and in times when he was hungry and thirsty. He followed God and was close to God the whole time. Number eight, Joshua recognized God's timing. He recognized God's timing. And he took his lead when God instructed him to do so. He trusted God's word completely. Uh, number nine, Joshua made his speech when it was his time to lead the children of Israel, he made his speech to the children of Israel. And you can read that in the book of Joshua. Joshua is an absolutely wonderful and interesting book of the Bible to read. Joshua made his speech to the, the, the children of Israel, and he referenced and honored Moses, their previous leader and his leader. So he did not forget the leadership of Moses. He honored him all throughout his life. And when you see where Joshua addressed the people, he constantly referred them to Moses and the leadership of Moses. Just to finish this lesson up and let's, just to see exactly what was the result of Joshua's leadership that he stepped into after God was preparing him to step into this role. Joshua, one verse. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. It says, and this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, And Joshua said unto the people, 
Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Now that word sanctify, it means to set yourself apart to God. Set yourself apart to God and to the work of God, to follow his leadership, his instruction, to study his word, and to walk in his promises. So let me read that again, because this was not just for Joshua and the people of Israel. If you want to follow the, the, the leadership examples of Joshua and become a leader yourself, this verse tells you what you need to do today, right now. And Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourself, set yourself apart for the work of God. For tomorrow, the Lord will do wonders among you. Follow the example of Joshua and follow God and trust him with your life. And tomorrow, God will do great wonders in your life and every day ahead of that. So that's our lesson for tonight. I hope that it spoke to some of y'all. I hope that some of y'all do aspire to become leaders one day. And uh, I'm thankful that God allowed me to uh, give y'all uh, this word um, from the Bible, from God's word. So I just want to pray uh, to close us out and uh, we will be done. Lord, thank you for uh, showing us your word. Thank you for, for giving us these examples in your word to, um, to lead us and guide us every day in our lives. And God, I pray that you would help us to, number one, um, seek to become leaders for you and seek to be examples for you right now. And God, I pray that you would uh, give us the strength and the power to stand up today and say, in the midst of a world that does not follow you, I'm going to set myself apart for you starting now. And I look forward to the promise that you have prepared for me and your blessing every day of my life. Lord, we'll thank you for that, and we'll praise your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, I said it was going to be short, and I think this was longer than any Wednesday night lesson I've given you. Hey, y'all are used to that, okay? Should have been no surprise. I apologize for going long. But, man, sometimes you, you start uh, talking about God's Word, and, man, it, to me, it's just exciting especially these old stories in the Old Testament. They're interesting, man. So uh, thank y'all for sticking with me. Thank y'all for listening to this. And uh, go and read the book of Joshua. I, I ask you to do that because you will enjoy it, I promise. And we will see you next time.